where was or where is the global economic government? So I go back to this promising past. A lot seemed to be nicely in order, well shaped, good organizations, new standards, procedures, meetings all over the place, and yet the 2008 crisis just went like sand through the fingers of all the big bosses of the financial sector and the financial uh, organizations. Because it turned out that there were actually no global institutional buffers in terms of standards that really regulated behavior, because a lot of the behavior of financial institutions was left to self-regulation. That was the official policy, for instance, promoted by the World Bank and the IMF, and that didn't work. Uh, early warning systems were hardly in place, and if they were there, there were no sanctions, there were no mechanisms to uh, enforce, so the conferences remained talking shops, like it's bad weather outside, but nobody with a recipe to do something about the weather. Um, and there, were, there was and there is a very fundamental disagreement about the economic recipe to uh, address the, the fundamental changes in the economy due to the technological changes, the underemployment and unemployment issues, the lack of growth perspectives, the question even what are the prospects for economic uh, growth, big disagreement between neo-Keynesian, neoliberal and state capitalism protagonists. And as a consequence, not the international organizations called the shots, but everything went back to sovereign decisions. The Americans doing one thing, Chinese doing the other thing, and the European Union first doing nothing, and then starting slowly to do some things that I believe are not very effective, but you may disagree with me. And, and the uh, IMF and the World Bank, I've, I've seen that also myself as part of the, of the board and, and as an observer in, in recent years, they are playing, they are important players, so I don't want to say they're nowhere. But they have become less effective also because they have become less representative. The Chinese, the Brazilians, the Indians, they are all complaining that the IMF and the World Bank are still leftovers of the rich man's club of former years, with the Americans still dominating and the Europeans, even to the extent that. To date, it has not been possible to have a president of one of the institutions coming from uh, outside Europe or America. I believe that's going to change. But it, it shows that the, the, the institutions, they are too slow to adjust actually to new circumstances. And there is also um, this discussion going on about, um, uh, this is very political in the US and the EU, but also in China and India, what is actually the recipe for economic growth and the balance between state and market? And everywhere, a similar type of discussion is going on. And apart from that, we have the usual market volatility, lack of regulation in the financial sector, but also in the sector of natural resources and trade. And you don't see at this moment a drive to really regulate that more stronger to put in place new institutions, here I should say with the exception of the European Union, because they have really um, um, managed better to found, to establish new institutions, to organize the internal order of the European Union, but it is still not very much connected with the global order um, that uh, is also for the Europeans, of course, the, the main headache. So here I come to the questions. I don't have the answers. But the questions that I think for any economist uh, are important, and by the way, as you see from these questions and from the, the issues that uh, I have highlighted, um, economists um, in today's world should also be a social scientist and a political scientist and should understand uh, the, ecolo the ecological dimension of the economy because uh, every, everything is, is interconnected in looking at uh, the uh, challenges for the future. Um, so 
we don't see the US or China or the EU or the IMF taking that uh, lead. We see a demography factor that is um, in um, different parts of the world, in different ways, um, um, challenging established growth economy because with a population that gets older and older um, and um, the issues with skills development to get the younger generation into the market, uh, the demography is in itself something that can drag the prospects for economic growth and something that needs to be better uh, understood. Same goes for the climate challenge. We, we see now slowly climate economy thinking developing that should uh, become part and parcel of economic modeling in the future but it's, it's only really in its uh, infancy and there are the issues of the rising inequalities that are simply not part of the uh, classic models of uh, economic development and economic uh, growth um, um, and the growth and participation implications of inequalities um, uh, have not yet been fully uh, understood. So these are the, the questions then um, that um, would lead, would have to lead ideally to convergence of ideas, alignment of interests and more effective and representative uh, institutions which is indeed a long and winding road ahead. When we look at the, the, the angle of the interests, um, it is unfortunately an open question that we seem to be in an era where state sovereignty has become again more important instead of less. There was a time that it looked like the classic state sovereignty of the 19th century would simply disappear into the new order defined by international organizations and supranational authority. We're not yet there. Look at the struggle in the European Union. It's really about the concept of is it Germany deciding about what's good for Germany? Or is it Germany as a of course very important part of the true European Union where the uh, overall interests of North and South are going to be met in a way that is more comparable to how the United States are uh, functioning. Because also in the US there is uh, a great distinction between the Northeast or the, or the West Coast and what's happening in the South, but yet there are mechanisms to do it more uh, together. This is an open question uh, that will also be very important for defining the prospects for economic development and growth in the future. And that goes also for the institutions. I mentioned this G20 group. Uh, it's actually been very disappointing what has happened. The G20 was established just at the time that they were needed. So it looked great. And then they turned out to be nothing more than just a meeting of those 20 countries, or 19 countries in the European Union. Um, but without the drive to set a new agenda, to develop new commitments, and to uh, regulate the sectors that need to be regulated at a global level. I believe that the G20 Secretariat could, in the end, a separate G20 Secretariat could be an embryo for a world government. And I, I really believe we, we will be there, perhaps not in my lifetime. But it will, it will, it will go that direction. But um, uh, at this moment, it's almost a standstill in the absence of uh, an institutional breakthrough with sufficient political support. And in the development of those institutions, it is very important not only to look at governments, but also to look at non-state actors, multinational companies, uh, big NGOs, international NGOs, that all shape actually the global international order today and should also be part of that um, so global government of uh, tomorrow. Um, just to uh, wrap up, I was thinking, okay, I'm talking here about global economic governance uh, in Georgia, 
uh, and I assume that uh, you are uh, very um, interested in these global uh, developments, but that you also wonder why, wonder how that impacts Georgia and where, where it actually positions Georgia in looking towards the future. I believe that um, I follow Georgia now for uh, more than 10 years, quite intensively, 15 years. I think that Georgia has really done well in terms of being, becoming a standards performer. Um, but of course with the problem that those standards are do have less authority because of all the reasons that I explained. Uh, that this global economic governance is not as strong as Georgian leadership rightly thought 15 years ago in the time of the Rose Revolution that it was in the interest of Georgia to really connect with those developments. It still is, don't misunderstand me, but it is more difficult because that global context has become much more shaky than it looked like, say, in the period between 2000 and 2005. So, of course, Georgia is affected uh, by the political turmoil uh, in the uh, immediate environment. Very different nature of political turmoil. Of course, what's happening in Russia with Russia is quite different than what's happening in the EU. But it's all impacting somehow the prospects of Georgia. The economic sluggishness, of course, uh, you um, see the consequences. Yet, I believe that uh, Georgia still has a unique proposition uh, if uh, democracy really uh, remains rooted and even more rooted than it is today. Huge progress, very, very interesting and fascinating, uh, very much supported uh, also um, uh, throughout the world. It requires keeping the uh, oligarchical tendencies in check. Uh, everywhere there are rich people, and rich people are influential. I mean, the U.S. is the, the best example of how rich people define politics with the recent announcement by the Koch brothers that they will spend $900 million in shaping the presidential campaign. So don't let yourself be told that Georgia in that sense is an exception. It happens everywhere. But you have to have checks and balances in order to make sure that democracy can continue to function. Poverty and unemployment reducing remains the task. Much progress has been achieved, but certainly much remains to be done. The EU association gives you the chance to progressively continue the converging, uh, converging on standards. It is important to shape political consensus on the long-term objectives and horizon of where you want the country to see heading for. Uh, of course, political polarization is part of democracy, but it's always important that there's an underlying understanding of where the common interests are towards the future. And quite essential is investing in high skills, high value products and production and services and full participation of people and this is, of course, an enormous challenge for the country. And it is a unique and pr proposition with a lot of good chances if also the Europeans understand their own history and commit towards a future that is widening the uh, European uh, area. And you know this is a discussion in Europe. This European Commission has decided in the coming five years not to have any new member in. It's actually the first time in the European Union history that that has been so explicitly stated. Yet there is an underlying conviction that the vocation of Europe is still in the direction of further enlargement, be it in an adjusted pace and with clear conditions. And I know very well, this is also what I'm discussing with the Georgian government, that Georgia is working hard into that uh, direction. So if all those conditions are in place, then the proposition of Georgia is unique and good, promising, promising future, uh, but uh, quite a lot of things to be done. And that brings me back finally to that context of uh, economic uh, 
um, governance for smaller countries, and I can talk also from the Dutch experience. It is vital that the economic, the global economic context is organized well, because otherwise you become a pinball in the hands of the bigger forces in the world. Um, this is the uh, Chinese view uh, on uh, the world as it is developing. Uh, USA and China in a big box, in a quite fragmented world. My wish would be that uh, we actually would be able to go back to that promising past after 1945, not because I'm nostalgic to the, to the period after 1945, but the, the basic idea about establishing an international order with international and indeed supranational authority is essential for managing the kind of economic crisis that we have gone through, that we are going through uh, in this uh, period of time. And in that sense, I would hope that that picture is going to be a bit more orderly as we uh, go forward in the next few uh, decades. But it's uh, in the hands of your generation to make that happen. Of course, the Chinese and the Brazilians are saying, well, there's so much investment need in the world that we can have a World Bank and we can have the, the Bank of the BRICS, of these uh, Brazil, Russia, uh, India, China, South Africa countries. And, it, and, and there's, by the way, also a big uh, infrastructure investment bank established by the Chinese. And economically speaking, that is true that there is an, an almost infinite demand for investment resources and those banks can provide. But of course nobody is blind for the political implication that this is also about who is deciding, who is in the decision chair. And in that sense it's a direct challenge to the old institutions, um, uh, IMF and World Bank, where for instance the Americans still have a veto power in the boards and where relatively many board seats are occupied by um, countries that in the past, including my own country, were belonging to the top 10 of um, the economies in the world. Um, but for instance now, my country has gone down to number 18. Uh, and, and, it will serve, and it will still go down more because other countries will come up. And that has to be translated into decision-making power into the boards of these institutions. So if World Bank and IMF would respond to this more uh, quickly than they do at this moment, you might see a kind of cooperation. You mean more representation? This yeah, more representation. If they don't, then this BRICS Bank or other initiatives will really uh, fly high. In the longer run, also Georgia will have to uh, acknowledge that they're part of, uh, say, a wider economic development. And suppose that Georgia would be a member of the EU. At some point in time, maybe after transition, the free flow of workers is one of the founding principles of the uh, EU. Free flow of capital, free flow of workers. But also in the EU, there are exceptions and transition periods. For instance, uh, still issues with regard to the um, um, to workers from Romania and Bulgaria in other countries. Um, and at the same time concern that if workers come from other countries that they should not undercut actually the minimum wage or the basic labor conditions. So what we see here, and probably also would see for the future of Georgia, even when it would not be a member of the EU, because it's also part of a global labor market and a global economic development, is that you, you have to find a good balance between preserving your national interests, but understanding that you're part of this global economy, at least a regional economy, and that in that sense, you better take proactive steps to become part of um, regional or international decision making on that. Because if you just say, just stay with your own, in your own cozy corner, so to speak, 
and you make your own regulations, you will find out that you're not interesting anymore for investors to come here, um, or for, or also for young people, skilled people, that uh, will won't find a place on the labor market here, but will go elsewhere. So you are part of that open economy and open labor market in the end, but it doesn't stand in the way of transition measures and trying to find gradual uh, transition to, to new realities. Okay.